Topic video 10, analog. It's not all digital these days. Analog subsystems is an extremely crucial subsystem to any embedded application. And the reason for this is the fact that analog signals surround us everywhere we go in the real world. So our entire real world is analog by nature. So it's really important that we convert these real world signals from analog into some kind of form that the processor can understand and of course processor can only understand the digital numbers so we need a subsystem that can take some analog signal and disc discretize that signal in some form so that the processor can then do something with it and of course the subsystem that's responsible for converting analog signals into the digital representation is of course the analog to digital subsystem. So the analog to digital subsystem is obviously the system that transforms analog signals to the digital domain and once it's in a digital number format then the processor can then multiply or add or subtract or do something with that number in order to process it in some sort of logical fashion in order to do whatever it is that that the application requires. So of course the digital number that we convert this analog signal into can differ in size depending on the analog to digital subsystem. We have with analog to digital subsystems we have varying word sizes that we can convert that analog signal into. Um, some analog to digital subsystems can convert them to 8-bit numbers, some into 10-bit numbers, some of them can do it into 12-bit numbers, some into 16-bit, 24-bit or 32-bit numbers. Depends on how much accuracy you actually require. We'll define sort of which sort of analog to, analog to digital subsystem you choose. If you need a really precise conversion from analog to digital, then you'll pick a analog to digital subsystem that has a larger word size. So the larger the word size, the more um, accurate sort of represent representation you're going to get when you convert from analog into digital. So when it comes to converting that analog signal into a, a digital representation, there is obviously limits. We might have a, a specific word size that allows us to have a certain accuracy in our conversions, but we can't convert every possible analog signal, so we need to put some sort of boundaries on these analog values that we can convert. So we have these two reference voltages that allow us to define the range of the voltage that we wanted to convert. So we have VRH, which is our voltage reference high, and this is of course our largest voltage value that we can convert. Any vo any voltage value that's or voltage in our analog signal that's any higher than this reference voltage is of course just simply clipped at that voltage value. So anything higher is just simply represented digitally as the maximum number we can represent it with. So therefore VRH is I guess our maximum clipping voltage. So any, any voltage higher than that is simply ignored or represented as if it was our only as high as the v, VRH. We also have the voltage reference, reference voltage um, low, so this is VRL, and this is effectively the lowest voltage that we can represent. So it can be any voltage, obviously it's got to be lower than VRH, but that will define the lowest, I guess, value that we can actually represent when we convert an analog signal to digital. So therefore, the lowest digital token that we can have, which in, case, which in this case is actually zero, will be represented by VRL. So if you put a voltage in that is equal to VRL, then the um, analog to digital converter will spit back a zero to us. And anything lower than VRL, then the analog, analog to digital subsystem will spit us back zero as well. So anything that's l equal to or lower to VRL will give us back zero as the digital token. So if VR, VRH is our highest um, voltage that we rec rep can represent, which means that we get the highest maximum word value that we can have. And VRL is our lowest possible voltage that will give us back our word value of zero. That sort of means that any sort of voltage, voltage that we put into our analog to digital subsystem between the VR, VRH and VRL 
will of course be represented by a digital token that follows a linear representation. So I've shown in this graph here a that example when we have VRH equal to 5, VRL equal to 0, and we have an 8-bit um, analog to digital subsystem. So you can see that the voltages between 0 and 5 are represented by digital tokens between 0 and 255. So there is a linear mapping from analog to analog domain to digital token domain. Okay, so I don't say they're actually digital voltages because they're not. They're actually digital numbers that represent those voltage steps. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. That it's not a digital voltage. It's just simply a digital number that is representative of that particular analog voltage. So if we have a fixed word size, so we know what sort of what the limit of our ADD subsystem is, so we know it's either an 8-bit or 16-bit or 24-bit analog digital subsystem. Okay, and we know our VR, VRL and VR, VRH, so we know our reference voltage values, and effectively we can work out what this linear stepping is between our analog and our digital token values. So we can work out what is the minimum analog voltage we require in order to be able to take a step in our digital domain, so to speak. So each digital token is incremented each time the analog voltage increases this um, stepping value that we call delta. <coughs> so to give an example, if we have a word size of 8 bits, then we know we can represent 256 different numbers. So this is between 0 and 255 between the, that represent the voltages somewhere between VRL and VRH. So therefore we can work out what the voltage difference between each digital number is simply by subtracting VRL from VRH. So we can work out exactly what our voltage, so this will tell us our voltage range. And then we can divide our voltage range through by our maximum digital token value that we have. So that's 2 to the word size so minus 1. So if we divide our, our voltage range through by the, the maximum value we can represent, then that will tell us what our, our analog step is. So that will tell us how much the analog voltage has to change by in order for there to be a change in the digital value. And we call this delta or step size. So therefore, to give you an example, if we had an 8-bit A to D, okay, which means we can represent 255, or sorry, 256 different val um, voltage values, which are from 0 to 255, and our VRL is 0 and our VRH is 5, then we can calculate what that voltage step will be. So simply work out the voltage range, which is 5 volts, divide that through the, by, by the maximum token value that we can re represent it with, which is 255, and you'll find out that we can actually, our delta is in fact 19.6 millivolts. Therefore, each time the analog voltage increases by 19.6 millivolts, the digital token that our A to D subsystem generates will in fact increase by 1. So should the analog voltage increase by less than 19.6 millivolts, then the digital token will not change. So this is how much that analog voltage must change by in order for there to be a change in the digital value that we're seeing come out of our analog to digital um, converter. So the relationship between the input voltage and the resulting digital token is shown in this equation here. So therefore the digital token DT is in fact equal to zero if VI, or the input voltage, is less than our voltage reference low. So if, it's, so if the input voltage is less than our low reference voltage, then of course the digital token is zero. On the other end, if our input voltage is greater than our, in, our um, high reference voltage, then of course the digital token is equal to whatever the max value is. So that'll be um, two to the word size minus one. And then of course, if the voltage is between VRL and VRH, then of course it's a linear representation which is equal to Vn minus Vrl divided by our step and that will tell us what the digital token is. Of course that would have to be um, flawed, that value you get. So you simply have to subtract 
the input voltage from the lower reference, divide it by um, delta, and then drop the decimal points. So by fluorine, I mean just round it down to the, the nearest, or round it down to the integer value. So let's do an exercise. If you really want to do this yourself, you can pause the video now and go through this exercise, or you can just continue watching and I'll tell you what the answer is, but it's up to you. You can pause it now if you want, or just watch me go through the ex exercise. So we have an ADD subsystem with a 12-bit word size, and VRH and VRL are set to 3 volts and 1 volt respectively. We need to calculate a few of these um, values. One, we want to calculate the step size, or delta, and then we want to calculate what the digital tokens are for these three different voltages. So if you want to do this, do this yourself, pause it now and have a go, and then unpause it once you've had a go. So when it comes to calculating the step size, we simply first of all find out what the voltage range is, so it's VRH minus VRL, so it's 3 minus 1, and then we want to divide that through by 2 raised to the word size minus 1. So we can work that out to be, well the voltage range is obviously 2 volts, and the word size, 2 to the word size minus 1 is 4097. So we divide those two, divide 2 by 4097, and we simply get 488 microvolts. So therefore, an increase in the analog voltage by 488 microvolts will in fact create a increase in the digital token value coming out of our analog to digital converter. So now we want to calculate what those digital token values were for those numbers, for those analog um, voltages that we had coming in. So bearing in mind the equation of dt equals zero if it's less than VRL, v, VI minus VRL divided by delta if it's in the range between our reference voltages, and of course max or 2 to the word size minus 1 if in fact it's greater than our higher reference voltage. So we know that 1.89 volts is between our voltage ranges so therefore we can use that formula in the middle to calculate what the actual digital token was. So it's simply take the input voltage minus the reference voltage and then divide it through by our step size. So we can work out that the digital token that we'd get back from the analog to digital converter is in fact 1823 so therefore the digital um, the analog voltage 1.89 volts is in fact represented digitally as 1823 okay so now we've got a, another one so we know that 2.4 volts is still within our voltage ranges so therefore the value we can use the equation so we simply did the digital tokens equal to our voltage input minus our voltage reference low divided by our delta. So if we do that calculation, it's 2.4 minus 1 divided by um, 488 micro, and therefore we get 2,868 as the digital token. So therefore 2.4 volts is in fact represented as 2,868 inside our processor. So therefore the analog digital converter would convert that value of 2.4 volt. 2.4 volts into 2,868. Okay, the last one is 4.5 volts, volts, but since 4.5 volts is actually greater than our higher reference voltage, we know that therefore it's going to be the maximum digital token value that we can represent it with, so therefore it's simply going to be 2 to the 12 minus 1, which is 4097. So therefore, 4.5 volts will be represented inside our microprocessor as 4097. And any voltage greater than um, our ref higher reference voltage would have been represented as 4097. So now that we've had a look at um, the process, some examples of how the processor might in fact convert, um, our analog voltages into digital voltage. I th think we might actually have a look at and see how it actually does it inside the processor. Okay, so now that we've looked at the analytical method of doing it, let's have a look at how the processor in fact actually does it. Before I cover how the processor does it, there's a little bit of additional information that you need to know about, and that is basically how a microprocessor may in fact convert a digital value back into an analog value. So when it comes to converting an analog, sorry, a digital value to an analog value, 
we simply use a resistor network similar to this and therefore by pumping a digital in this case a 5-bit digital number into this resistor network it will practically generate an appropriate analog voltage and therefore using some op amp or some amplification you can in fact then convert this analog voltage that you get to the appropriate voltage range that you might need so you can convert this um, analog voltage you get out of this resistor network back to the 0 to 5 voltage range or you know whatever your voltage reference or voltage you two voltage reference voltages are so therefore you're simply using op amps you can scale it up to the appropriate range so that's how you convert digital to analog and sort of needed to cover cover that because when it actually comes to converting analog to digital the digital to analog component is actually part of that system so this this is effectively how it's done there, there are many many different ways of converting analog to digital one of the most common methods of doing this is called um, successive approximation approach okay so it's, you can get a lot of a lot of microprocessors actually have successive approximation um, analog to digital converters so I thought I'd go through this example and show you how this works so this is how the system looks we have up in the top left hand corner we have our sample and hold circuit so therefore our voltage input comes into a sample and hold circuit which may be nothing more than a capacitor that simply has to sample that voltage and keep hold of it for a while so that you can actually do the conversion you then have a comparator so sample and hold feeds into the comparator the output of the comparator feeds into some control logic and attached to the control logic we have a shift register so the purpose of the shift register is it's simply going to pulse the possible bit locations that we have so it'll start with the MSB bit put that one high generate an appropriate analog voltage by pumping that value of the shift register through the control logic to the weights array so the weights array is in fact responsible for generating a sort of a digital value so to speak so it'll simply generate this digital value one bit at a time so it'll set the MSB high that appropriate digital value will be converted to an analog value that analog value will then be compared to the input that we've got and then the result of that com comparison would come out of the comparator and depending on whether, whether the voltage that we generated through our D to A is actually higher or lower than the input voltage then the value of 1 or 0 will come out of the comparator so if, if our voltage we generated is um, lower then the comparator will give out a 1 to say that the input voltage is in fact still higher and therefore that 1 that comes out of the comparator will in fact go to our control logic and the control logic will say to the weights array we'll leave that value in the MSB and let's use the shift register generate the next bit send that next bit set high into the weights array and then we'll try the next um, comparison so it's successive approximation so it successively tests from the most significant bit all the way to the least significant bit each the, each bit combination and if the comparative value is high then it simply keeps that bit um, in that position and then if the comparative value is low so the actual analog voltage you've generated out of your digital analog converter is in fact higher then it will simply say no nah, we, we won't leave that bit high and we'll simply set it to zero but you'll see what happens I've got an animation to show this all working so keep it in mind that first of all we sample our input voltage run it through the comparator um, run it through the comparator we have our shift array setting up the appropriate um, sh shift register setting up the appropriate values and pumping them through the control logic to the weights array and you'll see the how the weights ar array relates to the um, digital token value that we actually generate in the end so we have our input voltage of 3.8 volts this will be going through the sample and hold circuit and the sample and hold circuit on the right hand side of that box will in fact keep the value of 3.8 there for a limited amount of time so we've got to make sure that we sample this um, do this digital to, um, sorry analog to digital conversion very quickly before we lose that sample that's coming out of the sample and hold so we start with our shift register at 100 so we have the MSB set high we then pump that through to the weights array so the weights array has 100 in it that is then fed through the digital to analog converter and now we have the value of 2.5 volts coming out of the digital analog converter so one thing I didn't mention is the fact that this is a 3-bit successive approximation 
analog digital converter and our reference voltages are between 5 and 0. So we have our high reference voltage at 5 and low reference voltage at 0. Therefore, when you give it the value of 100 zero zero through a digital analog converter, that will generate the voltage in the middle, which is 2.5 volts. And when you pump 2.5 volts into the comparator, and you compare that with 3.8 volts, then effectively we'll get a 1 coming out of that comparator because the input voltage is higher than the voltage we generated out of that digital to analog um, circuit. So we get a 1 coming back to the control logic. That tells the control logic that, hey, the voltage we've generated isn't big enough yet, so therefore leave that bit in the most significant bit location of the weights register. Then the shift register moves along by one, so now we have 0, 1, 0 in the shift register, and because the control logic, coming out of the comparator, the control logic said, well, let's leave the weights array as it is, it simply adds that bit in there, so it simply ors it in, so now what we have in the weights array is 1, 0, sorry, 1, 1, 0. Pump that out of the digital analog converter, it generates a 3.75 volts. We compare that with our 3.8 volt, and you can see that, of course, 3.8 is still higher. Therefore, we got to get a 1 coming out of the comparator, and therefore that tells the control logic to leave that 1 in the second bit position. We then move the shift register along, and we have 1 coming like this, the zero zero one in the shift register, we pass that along to the weights array. And then one 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 is used to generate four point three seven five volts. Okay, and therefore that pumps through to the comparator. And when we compare those two, then of course our input voltage is less than the voltage we just generated out of the digital to, so the analog, yeah, the di analog to digital circuit, the D to A. and we get a zero through that comparator. Therefore, that tells the control logic, hey, that last bit that we put in there, put it back to zero. So therefore, what we have is we have have the value of zero, which means now that is the value we have at the end of our conversion, which is 110. So 110 is the closest digital representation that we can generate for an input voltage of 3.8 volts. So what happens, it depends on the, the word length that you have of your D-A. Effectively, it's got to go through all those possible compar comparisons. So if you've got, in this case, we had a three-bit successive approximation analog to digital converter. Therefore, it actually had to go through three comparisons before it finally generated what the, what the appropriate digital word was. If you had a 12-bit um, analog to digital subsystem, then of course you'd have to do 12 successive approximations or successive com um, comparisons before you finally got to your approximate digital value. So when it comes to our microprocessor, effectively our MC9S 12XDP512 contains two um, analog to digital subsystems on it. It is referred to in the um, data sheet as the S1280D10B8C7, sorry, CV3. Each of these subsystems has an 8 channel, 10 bit successive approximation A to D subsystem. So we have two of them on, on our chip. Okay, so we don't just have, we don't have one 16 channel, we have two 8, eight channel um, analog to digital converters. And of course, the reference voltages for these analog to digital subsystems are hard coded to 5 volts and ground. So, therefore, our high reference voltage is 5 volts, our low reference voltage is ground. And these are hardwired on the ADAPT 9S12X development board. We also have, with this analog to digital subsystem, we also have external trigger pins that we can use to initiate a sampling. So, they're similar to our external IRQ pins, but we can use them to trigger a sample of a particular um, pin. So therefore we can set up our ADD subsystem to when a particular voltage appears on one of our analog pins, we can actually cause it to do sampling. So we've got external trigger pins as well on our ADD subsystems. So to show you this what this ADD subsystem looks like. We have various sections of our ADD, so to, so to try and relate this back to the 
um, picture of the successive approximation sampler that we um, example that we did a few slides ago. This is our on-chip ADD subsystem, so you can see that we have our ADD clock. So this is to define how quickly that shift register operates, and therefore how quickly quickly we generate those. Um, words to go through the digital analog system and then back through the comparator and then back through the control logic. So the quicker you make the ADD clock, then of course the quicker it's, quicker it's actually going to sample your um, analog and convert it into a digital token. So we've got mode and timing control, so that's all part of our successful approximation subsystem. We have ADD triggering mechanism, so we have the blue section which is our external triggering, and we can turn that on with... Um, our analog to digital um, control one register as well as our digital input registers as well. We have our voltage reference pins and our voltage system um, um, voltage pins as well. So VDDA is our input voltage that is used to actually drive the whole system and VSSA which is our lower our ground to effectively so so they're, they're the two voltage driving pins to, to keep the whole system running. We have our two reference voltages that are used for our successful approximation register, which simply allows us to define, the, I guess, the voltage that comes back out of the DAC to um, allow that comparison. So we have the entire successful approximation register, the SAR and the DAC all joined together. And then, of course, we have our eight inputs, so AN0 to AN7 or AN8 8 to AN15, depending on which of the two ADD subsystems you're dealing with. And then, of course, we have all of those analog pins feeding into a analog multiplexer. And the analog multiplexer then simply pump, pumps the particular voltage through to the sample and hold circuit, which is then pumped into the excessive approximation um, anal um, analog to digital subsystem. And then, of course, as a result of all those conversions, we then have a series of results registers that can hold those digital tokens that we've just then gone and converted. So when it comes to connecting into the physical interface, as I said just said before, we have two analog to digital subsystems on our chip. One of them is ATD0, and of course you can connect to that one through AN00 to AN07, so they are our eight analog input pins for the ATD0 analog to, dig to digital converter. We then also have AT ATD1, which is our second analog to digital subsystem, and we have the access to those pins between AN08 and AN15. So depending on which analog to digital subsystem you're actually using, you've got to use the appropriate pins. Okay, so generally if you're going to use ATD0, then you've got the eight pins AN0, AN0 to AN7, which are the analog inputs. And also with ATD1, you've got AN8 to AN15. So you've just got to be very careful that you use the right pins for the right subsystem, analog to digital subsystem that you're using. When it comes to interacting with this analog to digital subsystem, I'd have to say that this subsystem is by far probably the most complex of all the subsystems. And I say that because it has by far the largest amount of registers. So because it's got the largest amount of control registers, it means it's got so many different variations, it's so flexible, you can get it to do so many different things, and, there, and therefore it's a lot more complex because there's so many different variations and you've got to know what every little bit means in order to use it properly. So it has to be one of the most complex um, subsystems that you'll come across. So we have effectively six control registers, so they're labelled control 0 to control 5. Be aware here that I'll put an X in the naming of these registers, so depending on whether you're using ATD0 or ATD1, simply change the X for a 0 or a 1. Also got our two data registers, so each analog input will have two data registers associated with it, so this is actually it'll be ATD1DRX high, so therefore the, the first X represents which ADD subsystem with it's 0 1, the second X represents which of the results registers between 0 and 7, so each of the subsystems will have seven sets of these um, results registers. And then of course we have two status registers, 
so stat 0 and stat 1, and therefore we have some pins also which are, allow us to set up the ADD subsystem so we can use it for a bit of general purpose input. So they're the two ATD um, digital input enable and ATD um, analog, um, so the, the port AD um, data register. So when it comes to configuring the ADD, as I said, we have six control registers that allow us to configure the ADD in a, to function in a certain way depending on what our application dictates. So we'll have a look at these six control registers in a bit more detail. So ADD control zero, this is our wrapping register. This is the register we can use to tell the analog multiplexer to wrap when it hits a certain um, analog channel. So we can say if we basically, if you want to do say um, 10, 16 samples of, I guess the first two analog channels, so analog zero, analog one, we can tell the analog multiplexer to wrap after it's done. The first, after it sampled the first channel. So it can sample channel zero, sample channel one, we can then get it right back to channel zero, and then do channel one, so therefore we can get it to eight samples of each of those two channels. So we can get it to wrap once it hits that particular channel one. So thereby putting the value of one in this register, it tells the analog multiplexer to simply flip black to zero once it's sampled um, analog channel one. So therefore you can get it to do many samples of um, say the first two or first four, analog um, channel so depending so therefore you generally use the first the zero channel then the one first channel then the second then the third so you generally use them in the order that way you can co allow this um wrapping register to control the, the analog multiplexer to wrap and therefore do uh, more than one sample of a particular channel if that's what your application dictates so therefore by putting the particular value into the wrap portion of this register you can effectively tell it when the, digi the analog multiplexer should in fact um, wrap, wrap back to analog zero channel. The first control register, this is effectively responsible for whether we want to use any external triggering pins. So if you want to have some external um, pins on, that use some of the um, unused analog pins to simply trigger sampling, so, so therefore you might want to have a external trigger, so like say an external clock that is then being used to generate the appropriate sampling rate so to speak. So um, this register effectively allows you to choose um, the external trigger. So it allows you to choose whether in fact you want to use the analog input channel as the trigger source or whether you want to use one of the triggering channels as the triggering source. So therefore you can define where the triggering source comes from and therefore you can actually define which of those eight possible channels you have at your disposal which one of them is in fact going to be the triggering source so this basically effectively is is to generate an external trigger similar to the way that you might use an external trigger on a crow you simply plug a clock signal into the crow at the external trigger point and simply have that external clock trigger the clock the crow to sample at that particular rate so therefore this might be when you might have a real precision sort of sampling that you need to do so you might need to be I guess you know if you're doing some audio experiments and you might need to be sampling at say 44 kilohertz then you might have an external 44 kilohertz clock that you've hooked into one of the external triggers and it's going to trigger that analog digital sampling at 44 kilohertz so this is might be used in situations where you need that precise sample rate but effectively as far as we're concerned this is where we start playing around with the um analog subsystem we generally don't use worry about the wrapping we don't worry about external triggering what we want for what we want to do we simply worry about getting a sample and we basically just need to start worrying about this analog digital subsystem by looking at the second control reg or control register two when it comes to using the analog digital subsystem of course you've got to turn it on so you've got to power it up so by putting a one in the ADPU bit location you simply turn on the analog to digital subsystem it takes it approximately 100 microseconds to power up so to get all the um, subsystem up and running get the successful approximation all charged up get sample and hold circuit all charged up and ready to go it takes it about 100 microseconds so therefore generally when you turn on the analog to digital subsystem you'll generally wait 100 microseconds so you simply put some real-time synchronization in there to cause it to delay 100 microseconds and once you've waited 100 microseconds then you can go about setting up the particular 
values of the various registers. So you shouldn't assume that any particular value of these registers, once the system is powered up, it generally resets the register values, so therefore you simply power it up first, then set the register values, and then use the, the other register values, and then simply use it. We've also got the a AFFC um, bit in here, which is our fast flag, fast flag clear all. So therefore you put a zero on there, it means it basically operates normally. So you just simply got to read the status register, and therefore it resets the flags. One means that you basically, so, so if you do a zero, you've got to read the, not only status register, but you've got to read the CCF flag. If you put a one in there, then it simply means you've just got to read the result register and then, and then simply it resets the CCF flag. So if you're doing an interrupt-based mechanism where you're not going to be looking at the status register, then you probably want to set this fast flag clear all on. But if you're simply polling the subsystem to see when a conversion is finished, then you're going to be reading the status register anyway, and you're going to be reading the data register to get the value that it's just converted anyway. So it depends on whether you're using polled or interrupt to whether you need to set this bit or not. So in a, in a polled method, generally doesn't matter what you set this bit to, but in an interrupt method, you do actually have to set this flag to be high. So the wait mode. So like our other subsystems, when you're waiting for an interrupt to occur, you can turn off various subsystems or put them in a low power mode. If this is a subsystem that you're waiting for to generate an interrupt, then of course do not turn it off, which means you want to leave a zero in the AWAI bit location if in fact this is a subsystem that you're waiting to do an interrupt. If it's not the, the system that's supposed to generate the interrupt, then of course you can turn it off by simply putting a one in that bit location. That means when you do a wait, all the subsystems will turn off except for the one that you're waiting to generate an interrupt. And then you've also got our control bits that allow, allow us to control our external triggers. So you can have them as, so you can set them to be either edge triggered or level triggered. Okay, and you can see, and then you can also set whether it's falling or rising edge or whether it's high level or low level, depending on what what the characteristics are of your trigger that you've got pumped into it. If it was an external clock, then you probably want to do it on a positive or, or a negative edge um, of that clock signal. Then also got the means of disabling or enabling the external triggers. So if you're not using the external triggers, then by all means make sure you turn this bit off. Okay, but if you are using them, then you've got to turn it on, otherwise it's not going to work. Also got our ADD sequence complete interrupt enable. So we've got our interrupt flag. So therefore, once you've told it to a conversion of so many samples, once it's completed um, doing that conversion, it will simply generate an interrupt. So this is the bit that you'd turn on if you wanted to make your subsystem interrupt driven as opposed to being um, software driven by the, our actual code. And then of course we've got a flag in there that we can use to tell us whether in fact an interrupt has occurred or not. So that's the, the ATD sequence complete interrupt flag, okay, which means generally in, a, in an interrupt you'd want to turn that flag off. Otherwise we'll be back in there again. ATD control two, this effectively, sorry, control three, this effectively allows us to do two things. And one is it allows us to um, set up the number of conversions we actually want to do. So if you just want to do one conversion, then you put the value of one in the SXC bits. So the S, S8C to S1C, you simply put the value in there to define how many conversions you want the ADD subsystem to do. Whether you want it to do the same analog channel eight or six or five or four times depends on other values you put in other registers but basically this tells you the total number of um, conversion you want it to do you can also then set the other bits in this register so we have the FIFO bit and this defines the behavior of the results register which basically means the results are stored in corresponding registers if you put a zero there one means the results are stored in consecutive registers which means if you've got it simply to do, say, eight convert, so you want it to do eight conversions, and you want it to do eight, um, basically four conversions of analog zero and analog one. So that's going to do eight conversions all up, but it's going to do four of each of those those um, eight analog um, channels. So therefore, it will do A and zero, A and one. So if you've got it set up here and be set to zero, then it means simply that A and zero would have 
the value for the analog channel zero and one um, the data register one would have the analog value for or the digital value for the analog one channel and so forth so therefore they'd fall into the corresponding um, digital result registers if you put in put a one in that bit location that means you'd have analog channel zero in the first results register analog channel one in the second um, second results register and then analog zero in the third analog one in the fourth and so forth so you'd have them in the um, Dig in the digital token registers that represented the order in which the conversions took place. So it'd be like a FIFO, first in, first out. So if we simply read from the first results register, and that would be the first um, digital value that was actually sampled. And then you've got your freeze bits, and they actually tell you how to, what the ADD subsystem should do during a freeze. And a freeze is generally when you've put the analog, um, or freeze is generally when you put the um, processor in background mode so when you're doing debugging and it goes into background so therefore the system basically stops this allows you to control what the ADD subsystem does whether in fact it stops whether in fact it finishes off its current word then freezes or if in fact it freezes immediately okay so you've got basically bits to control how the ADD subsystem works when you freeze it during a, de a debugging session We've also got the control register 4, and this control register 4 basically allows us to control the speed of the clocks. So it allows us to define how fast the various attributes of our analog to digital subsystem work. So therefore the time it takes to sample our, aided, our analog voltage can be programmed from 18 to 32 analog to digital clock cycles. So this ADD clock is generally our processor base clock. So therefore we can furthermore the ATD clock frequency can be programmed using the prescalar bits to produce an ATD clock in the range of 50, 500 kilohertz to 2 megahertz. So we can really define how quickly we want it to sample. So of course the, the best thing would be to pump it all the way up and have it sample very quickly and that way you get your results back very, very quickly. The disadvantage of doing that is the fact that when you sample a voltage very, very quickly and you pump it through that sampling hole, which is a capacitor, you give it a limited amount of time to charge that capacitor, you're not going to get a very accurate sample. So therefore, the longer you take to actually sample a voltage, the more accurate or the more stable that value will be in your capacitor. But of course, it's going to take you longer to get that value back. So it's, you know take the good with the bad so you've basically got to do a trade-off to see whether in fact you want a really accurate sample or you want it really quickly so with our control register 4 we have the most significant bit s res 8 this allows us to define the size or the resolution of our digital token that we generate or digital word that we generate we can effectively either have it, have it be a 10-bit or an 8-bit number so if you put a zero in that bit location it makes it a 10-bit number put a 1 in that location, you make it an 8-bit number. By default, it's a 10-bit number, so it's by default it's 0. But if you want 8-bit, then you can put a 1 in that location. We also have our sample time select. So these are our SMP1 to SMP0, and this is the length of time for sampling the analog input. So this is basically controls the characteristics of our sample and hold circuit. So by having this a long, for a very long time, ensures that our capacitor effectively charges properly and we have a more stable voltage. So you can define how many A to D conversion clock periods you, you wait and, and sample this voltage to ensure you get a nice clean voltage in that sample and hold circuit. So it can be set in between 2 and 16 analog to digital clock cycles. We then have a prescaler, which allows us to change the voltage of our analog to digital clock. So in the previous ones, we had the sample number of samples, uh, I guess the length of A to D clocks that we sample our analog voltage. So this is our A to D clock, and this is how we can generate our A to D clock. So our A to D clock is in fact a function of our standard base um, bus clock, which is by default eight megahertz. So in this table here, in this um, formula here, you can see the relationship between the ATD clock and the bus clock. So it's simply our bus clock divided by our PRS plus 1. And our PRS is 
divide in those lower five bits of that register and that's multiplied by 0.5. So that's the relationship between our default bus clock and our ATD clock. So therefore you can, using this register, you can effectively define not only how many clocks, how, clock cycles you take to sample that voltage to get a nice stable voltage, but you can also define how quickly or how, how fast the ATD clock runs. And of course this ATD clock is not only used to drive the sample and hold circuit, but it's also used to drive that shift register and, and then alternatively the comparator and the digital analog converter and so forth. So basically the speed at which the successful approximation um, system actually runs. ATD control 5, this is, a, this is by far the most difficult and yet the most important register of the whole subsystem. This is effectively the um, register that allows you to define how you're going to be sampling those analog pins. So with some of the other registers prior said how many conversions we're going to do, when we're going to cause the multiplexer to wrap and things like that. This one will actually tell you, um, will tell the ADD subsystem which pin we're going to sample and how we're going to do it. So we have the first bit in this register is the DJM, which is the results re um, data justification. So it's data, dust, data justification mode. So therefore we can say whether it's left or right justified. So there are advantages to using left or right justified. And, and it depends on your application to which way you'll, you'll set that bit. We then also have the ability to make our result a signed or unsigned value. So the D sign means digital sign. So therefore if you put a zero in there, it's simply unsigned data. If you put a one in there, then in fact it will be signed. And I'll show, a bit, show that in a bit more de detail later on. So I've shown down in the table the, what, what happens with the S res 8 and the, the justification bit and the sign bit. So you can see when you have the, the bit set to 1, then we have 8-bit mode. It's left justified and it's unsigned. When you have um, S res set to 1, DJM set to 0, D sign set to 1, then you have 8-bit left justified signed. So depending on those bit combinations, you can change the actual way that the digital token is um, generate or what it represents when it's finally finished. So you can be very careful how you set these bits to make sure that if you really want it signed, you make sure you put that bit high. If you don't want it signed, you want it to be unsigned, then make sure you leave it low. Okay, so be very, very careful how you set those top two bits. So you can see that when you have your justification and your sign bits set, then the, voltage, the values you get out of the subsystem can be completely different. So you can see that 5.120 volts, in fact, will come out as 7F if it's signed, or come out as FF if it's unsigned. Okay, so 7F will be the highest positive value we can have. You'll see that the value of 2.58 volts will come out as 01 if it's signed, or 81 if it's unsigned. So you can be very careful on how you set those bits because it will significantly change what that digital token looks like when you're finished. Okay, when it comes to the the other two bits in this register, not counting the C the C C A to C C bits, when you look at those bits effectively, the scan bit is it will show you whether you're doing continuous conversion sequence mode or not. So if you put the scan bit on, then effectively the ADD subsystem works independently and continually and continually scans the analog value. So you can simply set it up to say scan the first analog channel continuously and it will just keep scanning it and putting new values in the A to D um, result register to zero. So it will continuously scan it and, and put those values in that register. But if you want it in single shot mode, then you can simply put a zero in there. So it just simply does a single conversion and you've got to tell it to do a conversion each time. The way that you actually tell, tell the ADD subsystem to do a conversion is by writing to this register. And then you've got MULT, which is multi-channel sampling mode, which means you want to sample more than one channel. Okay, so generally by using the number of conversions you want to, want to do, and by using the remaining three bits in this register, CA to CC, then you can tell it which channels you actually want to sample. So if you put multiple channel and you say you want to do eight conversions, you put the multi-channel um, to zero, and you say put the value of zero in CA to CC, then effectively it will do four samples of the first analog channel. If however you put 
malt set to one and you tell it you want to do four samples so you got the s s s8 c to s 1c bit set to represent the value of four and you say you want to do four conversions and you set this malt to be one and you set ca to cc to be zero again and you write this to to the ADD subsystem which starts at converting it will effectively convert an zero down to an three and simply put those four conversions from those four separate analog channels in the first four data result digital result registers so that'd be the digital result register zero to digital result register three so that would have those so those four registers would have the digital tokens representing a and zero to a and three so when it comes to um, the last three bits ca to cc these effectively allow you to define which channel you want to sample. So as I said before, if you put it to zero and you say you want to do multiple channel conversions, then it will simply start converting from that channel that you specify. So if you go from zero, it will simply do four conversions from channel from channel zero. So CA and CB and CC let you define which channel to actually convert. So of course, once you've done a conversion, then of course the results will appear in these DRH registers. Okay, so we have, because we have a 10-bit um, register, therefore we can't fit 10 bits in a single 8-bit location, so therefore we have two 8-bit two registers that are joined together to make a 16-bit register, and therefore we hold our 10-bit number in that combined 16-bit register. Okay, so we have this combined 16-bit register, which is 80, 80DX, DRXH and ATDX DRXL. And as I said before, the first X represents either the 0 or 1 relating to the various ADD subsystem that you might be using, whether it's subsystem 0 or subsystem 1. And the last X relates to the particular results register. So both of those ADD subsystems actually have eight of those result registers and they're numbered between 0 and 7. So before you actually read a value out of these registers, you need to ensure that a conversion has actually taken place. And this is generally signaled that either either through an ADD interrupt, so if you're using interrupt mechanism, then of course you'd have an inter, uh, ADD interrupt service um, routine set up, and therefore you'd be inside that service routine reading these registers. Otherwise, if you're doing a polled mode, then you'll be polling one of the status registers and looking for the SCF bit to see, in fact, when a conversion is actually completed and once the conversion is completed then you can read from these registers so as i said before it's going to take a finite amount of time for it to do the conversion as you saw in the example it's got to go through that shift register process so once it's done that conversion then of course the volt the value digital representation of that voltage will be stored in one of these um, results registers so therefore you've got to wait for the conversion to take place and then you can read the actual value So as I, as I sort of touched upon already, there's the status registers, which will tell us exactly what's taking place inside the um, analog to digital subsystems. So status registers are always good registers to look at to get a good idea of what's actually happening. So in ATD stat zero, we actually have the SCF bit, and the SCF bit is in fact the most important bit out of this whole um, status registers and in fact this bit will tell us when a conversion is actually finished so if you're using a polled mechanism of driving the ADD subsystem then this is the bit you need to poll you need to poll this bit and see when this bit is set once this bit is set you know the conversions are completed and therefore you can read the various values out of the data registers okay if it's zero then of course you know conversion is currently taking place You've got the external, um, you've got check bits for the um, external trigger, and therefore you can have an external trigger overrun. If, it, if that bit goes high, you mean that you've missed an external trigger, something, the process has been too busy doing something else, it's missed an external trigger, therefore we've probably missed a sample that, that we should have done, but we didn't get around to doing. If you're using FIFO mode, you've got a bit here to tell you that the FIFO is overrun, which means before you got around to reading any of those values in the data registers, it's simply gone and filled them up again. So if you're using the ADD subsystem in a continuous mode, and therefore it's continually sampling and continually filling up the, the data registers, and you don't get around to reading the data registers in time, so therefore it's overwritten a value that you haven't read, 
you'll get an overrun error. And therefore, we've also got the lower three bits that tell us what was the last um, A to D channel that actually converted a a, num, a a conversion for us. So therefore, if the first A to D channel just did a conversion, then the value then would be zero. If, if the eighth one just finished it, then the value of 111 would be in that register. So if you told it to do eight conversions of all eight channels, then after it's done the conversion, then you'd expect the value of 111 in there. So this is a good mechanism of actually, if you don't want to wait the whole time, you can just wait for the first conversion to take place. So you simply poll those bits. Once it's got the value of zero in there, you go, oh, the first one's finished. Then you can then go and grab that value, start processing, and come back and wait for the next conversion to take place and then grab it. So you can use the CC bits to actually keep track of which conversion is currently taking place. Stat 1 is a, is a slightly better resolution. It will actually tell you which register is doing a conversion. So as you, as you like, I guess if you're sampling all eight channels, then what you'd expect as each as each channel finished its conversion, these bits would light up. So simply would go one, so you get the value of one, and then after the next one finished, you'd get three, and then after the next one finished, you'd get five. Oh, sorry, <laughs> you get you get seven, and then you get fifteen, and you get so therefore the bits would light up as each conversion um, completed. So you could use this register even even easier, easy to use this register to see when in fact a particular conversion is completed. When you're using the um, the digital, I guess the analog pins, when you want to use them for digital input instead of for um, analog input, you can actually enable them to be digital input. So generally, um, by default, this register is cleared. But if you set this, put set the particular bits in this register, then of course these pins get uncoupled from the analog multiplexer and they become digital input pins instead. So we can use the um, AN0 to AN7 or AN8 to AN15 for digital input instead of analog input simply by setting the bits in this register. Of course by setting the bits in this register you can then start using them for external triggers. And then of course you can also get the value that may have been written to these ports so therefore if you set them all up as digital inputs then you can now get the digital value that was written to that port simply by reading this um, register. So when it comes to using the analog to digital subsystem, there are two ways of effectively using the system, and that is simply by using a polled mode or using an interrupt mode. So when it comes to using a polled mode, we're generally going to require the use of a spin lock. So that's what the whole point of polled, as I've mentioned numerous times already, when it comes to using polled mode, then we're simply polling the status register, waiting for a particular event to take place, and once that takes place, then we break out of the spin lock and we continue on and we actually read the result of whatever it was we were waiting for. So first of all, we configure the ADD subsystem as required. We basically turn it on. So we've got to turn and write the um, ADPU bit in the control two register. We the type and number of conversions that we want to take place the triggering type that we want to use and we make sure the interrupts are disabled because we're doing polled mode, we don't want the interrupts on. We then basically start up the conversion process by writing the desired value of ATD control 5 into that register. So in this example here, we're actually using the first ATD subsystem, so it's ATD 0. So we write a particular value into the ATD 0 control 5 register. The program needs to wait until that conversion is complete before we continue. So therefore, we've got the SCF flag in the status register. So it's ADD0 stat 0 has the most significant bit SCF. So we simply want to check that bit. Once that bit goes high, we know the conversion is complete. So therefore, we can do a spin lock like this example down here, which is spin branch if clear. So therefore, if that bit is actually 0, we keep branching back onto ourselves. So we branch. As long as the most significant bit of ATD stat 0 is cleared, we branch back to spin. So we simply spin on the spot. And therefore, the second that that um, conversion is complete, that bit will go high, and therefore that branch of clear will not branch back to itself anymore. It will just continue on to the next instruction in our code. So to show you the code for the appropriate polled example, we simply 
have a subroutine called init ad so i jump down to init ad and we'll go through that first simply turn on the add subsystem so i move the value of eight into add control two so therefore the subsystem's turned on i then delay for 100 microseconds so in this example here i've actually assumed that i have a um, base um, bus frequency of eight megahertz otherwise that loop's going to be a bit quick or a bit slower if i've actually got a different um, clock frequency so once i'm pretty sure that we've waited that 100 microseconds i then go about setting up the other um, registers so i set up the control register two so i set the other appropriate bits in that register i also set up the control three so i turn say we only one conversion turn the fifo off i also then set up the sampling the rate at which i want to sample it so i don't really care too much about an accurate sample so i'll simply put the clocks at the fastest possible rate so i set the maximum um basically set the maximum sampling time 10 bit and fast add clock so simply fast add clock so i've got it sampling for the add sampling set really high but then i've got a really high clock rate so therefore the shift registers run really quickly and then of course that initializes my add subsystem so you can see that i haven't actually written to control register 5 because as i said before that will start the conversion so therefore if I wanted to write a subroutine that was called sample A to D, then it simply would have to contain the um, move the particular control word to the control register five, and then simply wait for the conversion to take place and then read the result out of the appropriate register. So, so that's how I could get it. That's basically how I'd write a sample routine if I wanted to write it. But in this case, since we're only doing a single sample, I'll put it inside the main loop. So I simply write zero to A to D control five, which basically tells it I want to do a single sample of our um, first analog channel so it'll do so basically starts that whole process happening by writing to that register i then sit there and i branch spinning on the spot waiting for the conversion to complete once it's completed then i simply read that voltage that that digital value for the input voltage straight out of the um, data result register the first data result register because i only did one conversion and it was for channel zero so therefore its result will be in the ATD0DR0H register. If I want to do it in interrupt mode, so same thing with polled mode, I simply configure the ADD, ADD subsystem as required, I enable it, the type and number of conversions as before are configured, the triggering type set up, and the interrupts of course are enabled. So the only th thing that differs from previous example is the fact that I've actually turned on the interrupts. And then of course I start a conversion. Okay, in order for an interrupt to be generated, it only happens when a conversion is completed, so therefore I have to start a conversion for the interrupt to actually take place. Program then needs to wait until that conversion is complete before reading the results, so therefore, because I've done an interrupt based, I've simply got the interrupt generating the actual... Um, so therefore I've got the ADD subsystem when it's completed it will generate interrupt then therefore the interrupt subsystem needs to deal with reading the results and doing something with it so the processor can in fact continue on with another task and doesn't need to wait for the result the ISR will simply take care of it whenever the um, ADD subsystem triggers it so to show you that the code for this I simply set up the interrupt vector base register to point to the appropriate spot in the memory I initialize the A to D in exactly the same way as I did before, except when it comes to using control two, I simply change that control word that I put into A to D control two, because now I have the interrupts on. Everything else I've left the same. And then of course, when I come back to my, after I've initialized it, I simply start the A to D subsystem doing a conversion. So I simply write zero to A to D control five like I did before. And then I simply spin on the spot. I don't even have to wait for the conversion to take place because my ISR will be triggered when the um, A to D subsystem is finished. So therefore, inside my ISR, I simply got load D with our result of that analog to digital conversion. And then simply return from interrupt, which will send me back to the branch always spot, which means nothing will happen after this. And of course, I've set up the appropriate location in the vector table. So I've stuck our... ADD ISR in the right location of the vector table. So in FFD2, that is where we stick the um, interrupt service routine pointer. So like before, should you require any further assistance, and please do not hesitate to ask your demonstrator, post a question on the forum, 
email me at the convener or make an appointment to see me, but please ensure all your questions get answered 